And as we well, want to do, which is to turn this thing on. Ah, uh, yes. And some, of course, acknowledgements. Certainly thanks to the Rachel Carson Center and to the City University of New York and John Jay College uh, for their institutional support. And, of course, a supreme thanks to my co-author extraordinaire, Karen Nicholson of the LMU. Okay. In 1963, Boeing Aerospace presented its first trial artificial environment. A new dominant part of the American industrial complex, Boeing was under contract to build NASA what it called a manned spacecraft. The manned spacecraft was an artificial environment that would meet the physiological and psychological requirements of humans in multi-manned systems for missions of 30 days to 6 months for a lunar colony and manned Mars. In what was supposed to be a five-man, 30-day experiment, Boeing was especially proud of its waste disposal system, which collects, processes, and recovers water from body waste, cabin condensation, and sink drainage, and its version of a closed circuit shower. You're noting already the cybernetic kinds of <coughs> metaphors being used here for a crew member debate. New biotechnology, however, did not automatically equal success. At the International Astronautical Congress in Paris in September 1963, Boeing's Chief of Bioastronautics and the Director of NASA's Office of Biotechnology and Human Research regaled their audience with the gruesome tale of the first test. Nausea and profuse perspiration set in um, after only two days and affected the entire five-man team. And after mechanical failure of the waste reactor, um, and the appearance of a yellow, oily substance, the crew was evacuated on day five. <laughs> Boeing's first trial memorably demonstrates how technology and biology met in the space age to determine exactly what were the parameters of an ecosystem required to keep several people alive for months or even years. The space age would take advantage of a flowering of scientific and technological ideas to understand the physiological and psychological requirements of life in a closed system. Both components took scientists and engineers by surprise. In April 1974, for example, Pravda published an article on the question, who should be entrusted with an interplanetary spacecraft? Good question. Um, finding its way just weeks to NASA, the story reported on two physicians, Mikhail Novikov and Yuri Senkovich, who had joined an Arctic expedition, an Antarctic expedition, and two separate voyages across the Atlantic Ocean of nonetheless than Thor Heyerdahl's headline-making raft of 1970, the Ra-2, which of course, as many of you will know, is the, is the, um, the later version of his more famous Contiki raft of 1947, where he sailed halfway across the Pacific. These were all closed environments to various degrees, but especially closed psychological environments. With close-knit, highly driven, and isolated groups of people surviving in unforgiving environments, they were experimental systems that, as Pravda reported, ensured, quote, ensured the psychological compatibility of an international crew on an interplanetary flight. If the success of year-long expeditions to the Arctic or of crews on nuclear submarines at sea for many months or of Thor Heyerdahl's ocean-going voyages demonstrated that a crew could psychologically survive an interplanetary trip, they did not convincingly prove the physiological aspects of life could be met. Thus, NASA contracted out to several companies like Boeing. In 1965, for example, another American major aerospace company, General Dynamics's conveyor division, agreed that the creation of a completely closed environment was feasible, but that the food waste loop remained a major technical hurdle, the food waste loop. What conveyor meant by this was that it had determined that incomplete studies of food's nutritional content, little knowledge about nutrients' journey through food and waste chains, and basic ignorance about the biological content of biological wastes prevented a thorough understanding of an entire ecosystem. One can almost hear the shock 
from the aerospace engineers of the company that built the Tomahawk missile upon realizing that urine and feces are prime examples of poorly understood, poorly defined substances. Okay? This is the key point. The guys that built the Tomahawk missile are also investigating urine and feces. This is why the Cold War is fascinating. Okay? Of all the outcomes between the United States and the Soviet Union, I really just can't resist. Um, of all the outcomes between the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union, the determination of the chemical and biological content of shit and its place within a dynamic ecosystem might well just be the most unexpected. What I want to offer you today in this brief uh, presentation is the idea that to live among the stars ironically required solving the very down-to-earth problems of waste management. Um, as we explain in our book, and this is the, uh, the title and the, uh, the working chapter titles here, in, man in engineering man-made environments for space, ideas about what waste is and how to deal with it took on now very familiar meanings, but at a very different time. Throughout the space age, and even now, the development of closed ecological systems to understand both permanent space station and ultimately a mission to Mars remains an anthropocentric challenge. Part of the making of the Anthropocene has been the common household sanitation system of flushable toilets linked to a sewerage system that is designed to hide, Benedict Benedictson said, and carry away human excretia. Plenty of people just don't want to have to think about the psychological and physiological demands of the Anthropocene, the exact same psychological and physiological problems the space age confronted head on. In our current crisis point, part of the task of the environmental humanities is to talk about the politically dangerous and socially repellent. The challenge of the Anthropocene is to find a way to talk about what people don't want to talk about. Just recently, Donna Haraway and Making Kin, Not Babies, Naomi Klein on reduced consumption in capitalist economies, NASA and returning your shit to you as food. Most people resist even engaging with such topics, a social point not lost on NASA's life scientists themselves. Joseph Gittelson, who actually came from the Soviet Union's project, and Robert McElroy, two of NASA's chief life scientists tasked with creating closed ecosystems admitted in their 2003 summary of nearly 30 years of work, that it was social resistance of astronauts and people which stopped food waste cycles being closed what they called the, quote, unjustified prejudice against incomprehensible, meaning people thought it was incomprehensible, biological technology. Resistance to biological technology in dealing with waste haunted the space program as it now haunts the Anthropocene. Being, hook, quote, hooked up to your own collection bag with a fecal collection bag flypapered to his rear end was just not the image of the intrepid lunar explorer that anyone wanted, said astronaut Ken Mainton Lee on Apollo 16. Worse still, when NASA was forced to address their gender imbalance in the 1970s, some engineers were tasked with the somewhat difficult problem of figuring out a urine collection system for the ladies. As then consultant Ru astronaut Rusty Swicart said, it's really wild. You know, people say, why don't you fly women? Well, Jesus, I'd hate to think about the plumbing. <laughs> this, of course, was the theme of Mary Roach's enormously popular book, which in English was titled Packing for Mars, but which in German is actually much better titled, Last Marked Astronaut than Ermel Bruss. Um, as good a summary as any, in the final scene, in the final scene of Ridley Scott's 2015 movie *The Martian*, has Matt Damon regaling, of course, a class of future space cadets that yes, he did survive on Mars alone by quote farming in his own shit, before assuring them that yes, it is actually worse than it sounds, and thus concluding, so let's not ever talk about that again. No, let's talk about it. From the very beginning of the space age, everyone knew that humanity would need plumbing to live in space. 
Fundamentally, the toilet is, as astronaut Scott Kelly said in just his 2017 biography, quote, the most important piece of equipment to master on board the International Space Station. Beyond the actual toilet was the act of, and the act of defecation itself, however, was the larger demand to create an entire waste management system. Okay, it's not only what it is, it's what you do with it. This has been a perpetual problem throughout the space age. To build a closed ecological environment, one of NASA's major laboratories, the Ames Research Lab, now in the heart of Silicon Valley, gathered experts on biological food synthesis, chemical food synthesis, and waste management for an April 1966 conference to present, to present innovations, quote, needed by NASA to sustain man in space for periods exceeding one year without resupply. After a welcome by Director Harold Klein and a first day of reports from the industrial contractors like General Dynamics, Lockheed, and Boeing, one of the more innovative solutions to closing the nutrient waste loop in closed environments was offered to NASA by William Oswald and Clarence Golicker of the Sanitary Engineering Department at the University of California, Berkeley. The culmination of about eight years' work, their device was called the Algatron, and it used living algae to recycle human waste back as water and air. It seemed impossible to Oswald and Golica that the space program could send anyone to the moon or Mars without a waste recovery system. The pair specifically criticized NASA for adopting such startling do-it-yourself processes as the handling of feces in a specifically constructed glove. Just in case you're wondering, that's actually what the astronauts did up until comparatively recently. I just want to let you all sink in. Just think about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah good. There we are. Um, the essential problem was that the human component of a closed system consumed energy and produced all manner of waste. In addition to solid feces, the, the pair noted, humans, disgusting creatures that they are, excrete urine, perspiration, skin oils, nasal mucus, sputum, saliva, tears, and semen, as well as liquids being augmented by gaseous waste including carbon dioxide, water vapour, regurgitated gas, and flouters. Okay, if you're going to live inside a spaceship, the equivalent of a Volkswagen bus, for several months, this is very important, suddenly. Okay? Okay. The essential problem, um, the beauty of the Algatron, was that it created an ecological system of living and growing algae designed to provide for oxygen generation carbon dioxide, as well as the microbiological waste conversion for humans sealed within an isolated capsule on its way to the moon, Mars, or, quote, indefinitely long periods on its way to the stars. Note, they're not also doing short-term versions of this. It is about an indefinite solution to the waste management problem, is what they're really thinking of. Okay. Um, and this was the final version of the Algatron. This is like the mock-up microtella system here. This is Oswald. Um, this is a pair of mice um, which are being suspended. This is the algae suspension down here being illuminated. Um, and so it forms a cyclical closed environmental system where it was supposed to go, um, for any of you who know what the Saturn V rocket looked like for the space missions, it was, this, it was supposed to go here in between the lunar landing mod module and the command module. Um, and it was supposed to look like this. These are the algae rotating drums uh, where you would feed in waste from the top and illuminate it, usually from the center, but they also had an idea about illuminating via sun sunlight um, from the outside. This is, this is what it looked like. This was 1965-66. Uh, it relied on algae. Okay? Algae was the heroic, almost utopian substance of the 1950s, promising no less than to cure world hunger. It encapsulated the process of photosynthesis itself, the foundation of life on Earth. For many life scientists and engineers of the space age, algae was the right stuff to move humanity into space because its own environmental conditions, inputs and wastes, were the inverse of humans. A controlled algae-based technology was seen as the ideal modernist solution. In an elegant, simple, and well-understood cycle, chlorella, algae, and humans 
formed a loop whereby the excreted products by humans, CO2 and human waste, would be consumed by the algae at the same time as the excreted products of the algae, namely water, O2, and the body of the algae itself, which could be used for food, would be consumed by the, by the humans. Okay? In a major test in 1963, the closed algae aerobic bacterial anaerobic system are recycled material continuously for 250 days. Thus, in a decade before James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis became an icon of modern environmental thinking, it was a pair of sanitary engineers working for NASA who actually built a closed system, a closed living ecosystem. While the science of ecology developed schematic ideas about ecological cycles, NASA and its industrial contractors actually engineered closed loop systems. Pointedly, they saw humans and their wastes as locked into the same ecological system as algae and its waste. Moreover, NASA's life scientists and engineers recognized that if one could build a system for Apollo, one could go a long way towards solving the pressing and overwhelming problems of sanitation, food, and water on Earth. Their ecological system, Oswald and Golica explicitly acknowledged as early as 1962, was really a, quote, miniature version of the grand-scale terrestrial ecological system of which we are a part, in that the basic principles of the two systems are the same, only the size and the variety of the constituents differ. In other words, as humans went into space, they learned about the boundaries of life on Earth, as scientists and engineers determined parameters of an ecosystem required to keep several people alive for months or even years, they simultaneously learned of the conditions for the interrelated existence of all life back on Earth and how to test them. For Boeing, for example, they got on with the job of researching um, algae waste tanks and then learning how to bake algae cupcakes. These are evidently algae cupcakes. Okay. Note the arrows. Okay? Note the algae. Note the arrows. Yeah, yeah, think about that. Okay. More familiar to many of us will be another closed environment from the 1990s, the Biosphere 2 project near Tucson in Arizona. Okay? These guys, not looking so wacky anymore, are they? No. With the effort of NASA and the military industrial complex in mind, let us quickly revisit the Biosphere 2. The Biospherians, as they called themselves, wanted to create a dry run at a living space colony. For the initial experiment, Mission 1, between 1991 and 1993, over 4,000 different species of plants, animals, and microorganisms were enclosed within the three-acre structure, which was divided into five separate climatic and ecological zones. What has received the lion's share of the attention has been the psychology of Biosphere 2. As Biospherian Jane Pointer pointed out, quote, the eight of us had risked much to live as if on Mars, including starvation, social isolation, and the psychological pressure of being part of an intense and very small community. As mm, some of you may know, in the end, four of them hated the other four of them after being stuck inside a three-acre building for, three, for, three, uh, for two years. Um, to this day, I believe, they still don't talk. Um, another pair of Biospherians, however, Abigail Ayling and Mark Nelson, uh, it's Nelson on the, on the far, far left, um, the project was more about physiology, seeking to understand the closed sustainable ecologies needed for the human habitation of space. As part of that understanding... It was accepting that there was no toilet paper. The reason was that their recycling system could not actually handle the amount of paper eight people would generate during their daily toilet. They used a water squirter instead. Yes. In fact, the Biosphere 2 was equipped with a physiochemical water recycling system. As Ailing and Abigail and Nelson noted, quote, all of the water that comes from the human habitat, from toilets, showers, kitchens, and laundries, goes into the basement of the agricultural area to our waste recycling systems, which was checked, they stressed, every day, because it's the most important system. 
Biosphere 2 explicitly used technology, um, explicitly used biological technology, relying on natural helpers like ladybugs to ward off insect pests, as well as a mechanical algae scrubber system to remove the excess nutrients and add oxygen to the Biosphere 2 um, ocean. Okay, so this is when you revisit the project from the bottom up instead of the top down, you start to see other things. Likewise, NASA's own project, which occurred in 1997, was the really less better named Lunar Mars Life Support Test Project, or LMLSTP. You get very much used to acronyms working with NASA. The longest one I've seen so far, it's like a German word, it's like 13 characters long, it's ridiculous. NASA assembled a full-scale facility to test systems planned for the first permanent space station, the International <laughs> Space Station. For 91 days, the four-person crew, um, in fact, this was the 91-day crew, this is actually a shorter crew, um, of three men and one woman, existed on fully physiochemically and bioregeneratively recycled air and water, ate food produced in plant growth chambers, which accounted for about half their calories. They didn't seal the food cycle, but they got, they got halfway. And fertilized their crops with their own solid waste processed through a new invention by NASA, the, quote, solid waste incineration system, the SWIS. Unlike the earlier solely bioregenerative attempts of processing fecal waste through algae and bacteria, the LML STP burnt all solid matter to render it mostly a CO2 and some byproducts, which they then fed, they fed the CO2, into their plant growth chambers. The water recovery system used anaerobic bacteria as the primary treatment for all wastewater, including their urine. The LML was actually a remarkable success. Across the 91-day trial, NASA concluded, an initial eight-day water allocation was cycled ten times through the crew and water allocation. Okay? Eight-day allocation survived them for 91 days. While the human test subjects themselves were integrated with the biological and physiochemical life support systems. In other words, they've become completely cytogenic at this point. Okay? As indeed as indeed the International Space Station is. Subsequently, over the last two decades of human occupation of the International Space Station, recycling systems really stand as one of the project's most significant accomplishments. Most water is reprocessed and returned to the crew, including that from Europe. The solid waste incinerator module, however, tested in the LML STP, was one step too far. Uh, currently, all solid waste is relaunched, from, is saved up, and then relaunched from the International Space Station to burn up in the atmosphere. Think about that the next time you breathe. Um, still, life in space, see, it just gets more fun. Still, life in space beyond the maintenance of mere humans has made great strides. As astronaut Scott Kelly was surprised, he said, by the public reaction to eating lettuce grown on the International Space Station whereas the spacewalks of his comrades got almost no public reaction at all. The lettuce he ate, Kelly noted, was not only surprisingly good, but was in fact the first time an American astronaut had eaten a crop grown in space. That was 2015. So to conclude, since the dawn of the space age, since the dawn of the space age, space habitats demanded thinking about life support systems and faced squarely the challenge to understand, control and engineer a dynamic and complex whole environment. To those in the space age, the, physio the psychological and physiological presented numerous challenges that are, even now, still only barely solved. Moreover, solutions to the clearly anthropocentric challenge of living inside a space capsule or a, spaceship or a station for weeks or even months came from addressing issues that no one wanted to talk about. Identically, as Oswald wrote early on in no less than the American Journal of Public Health, the use of algae for waste treatment and food was, quote, the solution to a few of many of the more interesting and significant problems facing civilization. Thank you very much.